We take for granted that we can remember where the biscuits are kept in our cupboard. We have a brain and somewhere this stores information in the form of memories that we can access to help us find those all important biscuits. But our body and brain are complex systems built of thousands if not millions of cells working together. How is it possible that one of the simplest organisms consisting of only a single cell can somehow work together and store memories that it can access? A new study published in the Journal of Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences investigates how giant slime molds encode memories in response to food sources. Let's explore what they discovered and let's see where it leads us. In the study, the scientists observed a slime mold in a laboratory setting and used this to generate a theoretical model. Using both of these, they were able to determine that the changes in the organism's tubes happened in response to a newly introduced food source. They were able to determine that it took the slime 45 minutes to reorganize its entire network of tubes to face the new food source. It then took another 45 minutes for the mold to start moving towards the food. After 310 minutes, the slime had fully engulfed the food source. When they then removed parts of the slime mold to make it smaller, the mold now would reorganize itself in only 15 minutes and would begin moving towards the food source a further 30 minutes later. This study showed that slime molds are capable of making decisions within 10 to 20 minutes. What drives this decision process is unclear. It appears as if the slime mold is able to achieve this through the encoding of the location of the food source via the network tubes. The scientists then set out to test this exact idea. They used their simulation to show how an agent from the food source likely entered the slime mold's tube. They used a softening agent near the food to cause the tubes near the food source to expand and dilate. These dilated tubes then imprinted the memory of the nutrient source in its network. More remarkable is that it appears that this isn't a one-time response. Rather, the slime mold has irretrievably changed the flow patterns of its tubes and this is a sign of long-term memory function. The study found that slime mold encoded memories of nutrient sources within their tubes. The tubes that survive the longest are those directly bearing the memory of the nutrient stimulus that led to their growth. Hence memories are stored in the hierarchy of tube diameters, and particularly in the location of the thick tubes. These are subsequently layered on top of each other, with every new stimulus differentially reinforcing and weakening existing thick tubes in superposition of existing memories. So why is this a big deal? Previously we had assumed that only creatures with a central nervous system were capable of memories. Creatures like this slime mold do not have this, so should not be able to store any memories. In most animals, memory typically forms as a result of synaptic plasticity, and this essentially means that the brain makes connections across specific neural networks that are strengthened over time. This study shows that a similar mechanism can be achieved in the tube networks of slime mold. Memory function is normally reserved for only higher level organisms, and this research suggests that even the simplest life forms have memory. Fungi like this slime mold play a vital role in sustaining the ecosystems of trees. This is very obvious when you examine the remarkable story of the zombie trees. Normally plants use their leaves to make food from the sun's energy and carbon dioxide. With the exception of a very few parasitic plants, no tree is known to grow without green foliage. Some can however end up as zombie trees. This happens when they lose all their leaves and large parts of their trunk. Often they die, but every now and then, these trees are kept alive by the surroundings. This is something that has been observed for almost 200 years, but the evolutionary and physiological processes leading to their existence remain a mystery. This is partly because they are so rare, and whatever happens on their journey from feeding themselves to being fed happens out of sight, likely below ground. It is already known that trees can send each other signals through a network of fungi buried among their roots. These signals can include communications about environmental changes and the transfer of nutrients to neighboring trees before they die. 
Ecologist Susie Simard suggests that this supply can continue beyond their apparent death of an individual tree. She measured the water flow in the stems of a living tree stump and its neighbouring tree and showed an underground connection was likely responsible for the survival of the stump. If forests feature interconnected root networks where water, carbon and nutrients are exchanged, this would be the equivalent to power, water and gas grid supplying a city. There is evidence that shaded trees are supported by non-shaded trees and the fact that zombie trees are still supplied with their resources gives rise to the much bigger idea that forests act and survive as a whole. As if these stories were not remarkable enough, I would like to end by looking at a recent study that seemed to demonstrate that flowers are able to sense the buzzing of a nearby bee and can temporarily increase the concentration of sugar in their flower's nectar. This means that the flower itself is acting like ears, which are tuned into a very specific frequency of the bee's wings, and yet it can tune out irrelevant sounds that might be created by wind. As the researchers looked at how sound works, and specifically their relationship with flowers, they realized that the shape and size of the flower tends to be a concave or bowl shape. This makes them perfect for receiving and amplifying sound waves. When they examined the shapes of the flowers, they discovered that it would resonate at specific frequencies created by a bee. They tested their idea and then started to remove some of the petals and discovered that these would fail to resonate at the required frequencies. This concept of plants hearing opens up many questions and also links back to the idea that trees and plants in a forest can communicate with each other. Could it be possible that they sent other herbivores nearby and can warn their neighbours? It may even be possible that they can generate sounds that attract animals involved in dispersing the plant seeds. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.